This is my talk today on, on brief videos to reduce public stigma uh, toward young people living with psychosis. And I'll have one slide about other projects we have. And I start by saying that brief videos are, you know, big influence today upon our lives. They, you know, impact if we are happy or anxious or, you know, so, some of us, especially among young people. Um, I was I was interested to understand more about um, it impacts on you know mental health. Um, so, and bottom line, my research interest is to understand how to develop brief video that can help people with mental illness and specifically get them earlier into in in the process into care. Um, so that that's the focus. This is a list of my uh, conflicts of interest and awards. Um, I'll start with a few slides of introduction and, and, and specifically, I wanna speak a little bit about stigma, okay? Stigma is a label that is linked to negative stereotype or negative trait, right? There are several kinds of stigma. I'll focus today on public stigma, which involved pervasive negative attitudes and belief that lead society to reject people with mental illness. Why it's important? Because studies show that seven out of 10 people with severe mental illness are not treated. While access to care and availability of services are important reasons, stigma also plays a significant role. And, and I want to focus on that, you know, amazing number, 30%. 30% means that all of our, you know, research and clinical focus, imaging, data scientists is focused in helping the 30% who are uh, able to reach out and ask for help. But there is a lot of people who don't do that, and 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 my and my focus in is how to how to get to them, and that's a that's a big focus of mine. Um, so what do we know about intervention to reduce stigma? Right. Overall, um, we know that narratives are effective, probably the most effective tool to reduce stigma, but it's a double-edged sword um, as it might increase stigma as well. Right. And there is few principle of how to use narratives or you know, stories to reduce stigma. One, that person-centered language is essential, right? For example, to say a person living with schizophrenia and not schizophrenic person, right? That's the first principle. Second, emphasizing solutions seems to reduce stigma. Common sense approach have backfired. For example, research shows show that comparing depression to a chronic disease like diabetes decreased hope uh, for recovery, so it's actually increased stigma. Using sympathetic narrative, the stories that humanize people may reduce stigma if they include certain elements, right? Bo, you know, mentioned, I think the thorough work that we're trying to do here is because we, we really try to understand what's the formula that gets us to stigma reduction, reduction right? Um, so a balance between symptoms and recovery are essential. Highlighting external reason for the person condition also, also found to reduce stigma and emphasizing violence drive up stigma. So that's another thing to uh, keep in mind. So what do, what do we know? What is the knowledge gap, right? So we know that interpersonal contact with a person with lived experience reduces public stigma. We also know that most studies show that video intervention have a similar efficacy to in-person intervention, but you know while being simpler to replicate um, and easier to disseminate to large population. However, existing video intervention, you know, before we started that line of work, were on average 24 minutes per video, which we all, I think, understand that this is very long considering a limited attention span that people have today um, and also limits the scalability of the videos. So it leads us to the, to, to the main research question of, of can brief video, right? Intervention reduce stigma. So a few principles about the study I'm about to present that we, we use crowdsourcing, all types of crowdsourcing, cloud research, Amazon Mechanical Turks, and prolific. It's a cost-effective way to get a lot of people into our studies. Um, and then we, we use Qualtrics to, to build surveys and show them videos and then hear what they think about the videos and and follow up with them to, to, to see what, what was sustainable. And in terms of methods and, and outcome measures, we use the same battery of, of public stigma domains, right? It's five, five subdomains. We ask about 
um, social distance, which, you know, the, their willingness to be close to someone with uh, schizophrenia, they, it, it's questions like, would you be willing to be a, a friend or a neighbor of a person living with schizophrenia? We ask about stereotyping, which include items about how able is a person with schizophrenia to make their own decisions about their treatment. Separateness is a, how different do you think a person with schizophrenia is from other people? Social restriction, whether people think uh, we should ban people from with schizophrenia from getting married or having kids. Um, and perceived recovery, whether people believe that person or people with schizophrenia can get better, right? So these are the domains that we are testing. Um, the first study is a study that you know was a proof of, co of concept. We took an 11 minutes video that we knew is effective. We edited it into 90 second video, and then we presented it to 1200 people. As you can see, um, a third of them, 400 watched the video, a uh, third uh, read written vignette, and, and third were in the control group. I'll show you a small section of that video, the first half of it. Every day is a battle, I'm not gonna lie to you. Every day is hard because it's not easy going outside, taking the train, being around people, providing customer service <laughs> when you think the world is just out to get you. <laughs> now I understand that that's part of my illness and that's not my reality. Okay, so going back to the study, um, that was the first half. The second half was about, you know, the recovery process. Um, you can see that the video um, group showed the least, the less stigma, right? Uh, in, in compared to the written vignette group that showed less stigma than the control group. Obviously we had several significant limitations, right? We had no baseline assessment or follow-up. Um, so we basically wanted to replicate the results in a better design, right? And that, that was our uh, next step. So while using the same intervention, the same video, we added a baseline and 30 day follow-up assessment. Um, and moving forward, all the studies that I'm, that I'm about to present will follow the same similar design of baseline, then post-intervention assessment, immediate post-intervention assessment, and a 30 day follow-up. Um, so you can see from the five graphs that represent each of the five subdomains that I presented, that the green line represent the video group. You can see a sharp reduction in stigma across scales after watching a video. And despite a slight rebound, there is still a significant effect on day 30. The vignette, on the other hand, which is the orange line, did show some effect post-intervention, but usually with no sustainability over time. So that's another important difference between you know, reading vignettes and, and, and short videos. So I hope that by now I was able to convince you that a brief video reduces stigma, at least in short term, right? But how does it work, right? That that what we were eager to understand. We assume the mechanism of action is identification and emotional engagement with the protagonist. Um, and a secondary analysis uh, of our studies show a greater reduction in stigma among participants who shared the same demographic. So, Race and gender might be a possible possible moderator, but we needed to take a closer look. So the next study was basically a study which had four different video arms. As you can see, uh, we had a black um, female presenter, white female presenter, black male presenter, and a white male presenter. And we recruited um, and randomized nearly 2,000 people to five arms and an additional uh, control arm. Um, and all protagonists shared their personal stories. It, it, was, it, it was about the same length with the same structure of you know, balancing between symptoms and recovery themes. Um, and the only difference were, was basically the race and gender of the protagonist. Um, and and you know, beyond covering a wider spectrum of presenter, we were interested to learn whether matching the protagonist gender and race with the viewers increases the intervention effect. So what did we learn? Um, as you can see by 
you know, basically the overlapping lines, all video were similarly effective across all domains and were more effective than the control, than the control group in reducing stigma. But we found no differences in stigma scores by protagonists, gender and race, and no greater reduction in stigma when matching the race and gender of the protagonist to the participant. Um, we were a bit surprised by that, as we assumed that shared demographic characteristics would enhance identification, emotional engage engagement. But we did a little thinking and realized that in order to maintain the uniformity of the video content, we basically strip unique aspects of each of the presenter narrative, right? Aspects as gender specific influences or cultural background. And this might have an impact on the ability to identify and emotionally connect, especially in specific groups. So our next study, right, in order to address that specific thought was um, test the effects of tailoring to vid the video. And in that case, to gender experiences, right? We we separated gender out of race and we we started to think about gen gender separately. What what is unique about you know not just being with schizophrenia, but for example, being a woman with schizophrenia. So we assuming that focusing on you know woman experiences would enhance identification among uh, women viewers. So we recruited nearly twelve hundred people um, and randomized them into three groups, right? The first one is the generic video group, similar to what we previously presented with no mention of gender experience at all. Um, second group was a group that watched a video with gender related um, uh, experiences um, and a control, right? Both video were presented by the same person to, to kind of, um, that will be able to focus on the content itself. So let's let, let's watch a short uh, section of the gender-related video, so you'll have a better understanding of what I was referring when I said uh, gender-related experiences. People are usually people are usually surprised that I'm a woman uh, experiencing psychosis. the The perception is usually um, men who are experiencing psychosis. When I was a teenager, I was actually sent to a substance use center because um, they didn't believe me that I wasn't taking any substances. They definitely didn't hear me out. And I know that that often happens with women in any kind of healthcare setting. It is very hard to live with schizophrenia, but I believe it is harder to live as a woman with schizophrenia. Yeah, the last sentence was also the, the title of the paper. Um, so first, as you can see, you know, the same five subdomains, um, both video reduced stigma in a similar pattern to our previous studies. And overall, we didn't see any differences between the videos as a whole, right? But when we took a closer look, right, into the gender related video group, we found that in three out of five stigma scales, the social distance, the stereotyping and the separateness, women showed a greater reduction in stigma in compared to men, which did not happen in the generic video and control groups. So the gender related video showed an additional effect, but only among women, which was an important finding. So content does matter. And the next, the next um, step was to do a similar work um, in regards to race. So, Similarly, we tailored the video to race experiences, right? We conducted two focus groups of young black people living with psychosis on track participants and based on themes that we found to wrote, to wrote two scripts. A professional actor presented the story of a black uh, person living with schizophrenia once with no mention of race experiences and once you know, a similar uh, structure to what I previously presented with the race related experiences. Um, we oversampled black participants to allow comparison of, you know, black viewers versus non-black uh, respondents. And we added a new measure of emotional engagement. That was the difference between, you know, this and previous um, studies. Um, so you can see, you know, first looking at all three groups, similarly, 
Uh, we were happy to see that overall the effects of the stigma reduction uh, in this sample as well. Uh, we didn't see any differences between the videos overall. But um, for, the new, for the new measure of the emotional engagement, when we looked at differences by race in the generic and race-related video groups, we noticed that while we saw no difference in the generic video group, black individuals showed a greater emotional engagement with the video protagonist in the race-related video group. Right, so it increased, it created an increased emotional engagement specifically in the race related group among black viewers. And similarly with the gender uh, study, um, when we looked into the race related video groups, we found that in four out of five stigma subscales, black individuals saw a greater reduction in stigma, which, we, which did not happen in the generic video and control groups. So. Again, tailored experiences does make a difference, um, especially among the target audience, which made, made a lot of sense. <clears throat> Just to summarize, you know, a different look on, on some of the papers, um, if we, you know, measure the level of disagreement, right, um, with, the, with the items. For example, let's take the first item. Would you be willing to have someone with schizophrenia as, as a neighbor? So when we take the 1,600 people who watch the video in our first three studies, 400 of them, about 27%, said no, which means they're not willing to be a neighbor of someone with schizophrenia. We showed them a 90-second videos and immediately asked them um, the same question. And now 14%, uh, 200 people, said they are not winning, which means we had a 50% reduction, right, in the in, in the disagreement level. And when we asked them on the 30-day follow-up, we had 16% people saying no. So the majority maintained, right? Most of the people uh, who, were be, who we were able to change their mind still um, are green, right, to cancel their disagreement, right, to, to be a neighbor of someone with schizophrenia. So that's, that's uh, you know, uh, uh, a perspective that, a, that give us a hint about the potential of behavior change, right? That's obviously not a behavior change because you didn't measure how many of them uh, search an apartment, but, but that give us a hint about it. Um, so, you know, so far I showed you um, like we try to answer the question, how does it work? And now I'm trying to shift the focus, taking a zoom out and speak a little bit about what form makes it work best, right? We're trying to understand different aspects of the brief videos. So the next, the next basically line of papers, right? We had two studies exploring that was to understand, you know, selfie videos to reduce uh, stigma where there's selfie difference from, you know, traditional videos and to have a little more understanding about the length. Um, the, the, the reason for that is we were, you know, looking forward to our, our next series of study, which relate to social media and Instagram, and I'll speak about that. So what we did was basically, it was a non-inferiority uh, study, was to compare traditional video as we tested before, which lasted about 90 seconds, to a selfie version of, of, of that video, which means filmed by the participants or actor, that depends, themselves, uh, with no you know, comments about editing or they did it completely by themselves and send it to us. And it also was a bit shorter, which means up to 60 seconds. And we compared these two videos, uh, but obviously maintained most of the content um, in a reliable way, of course. And we compared that to a video control. And we conducted two different studies, one of adolescents asking about depression stigma, and a second one on the same topic that just pre presented so far of young adults asking about stigma toward, public stigma towards psychosis, as, as I was speaking so far. And we took the same. Here, it's, it's a participant, right? It's, it's a person with lived experience and showed her traditional video and, and a version that she curated herself uh, uh, a selfie video, a shorter one. 
And I'll show you, uh, and we did the same design of pre, post, and 30-day follow-up. So I'll start to show you the results of the second study. I'll focus on that. So you can see here, again, the overlapping lines, which means we found no difference between the selfie video and the traditional film video, which means they both were effective in reducing stigma. Um, and, uh, and it relatively was sustainable. No difference between videos. Um, which means, led us to the conclusion that traditional equal selfie, and selfie, by the way, it's much cheaper to produce, right? There is a lot of implications of, of, of uh, you know, the, the video production company that worked with us, that wasn't the best news for them, that selfie videos create the same, you know, efficacy among young people, and both of them uh, decrease more stigma than control. And basically, we didn't lose much, if at all, when we reduce the video length from 100 or 90 seconds to a 60 second video. The next uh, interesting question that we would like, we wanted to explore is whether um, a, a, you know, a video presented by, by a person with lived experience is different and how from a, from a story that was designed and written by a person with lived experience, but presented by an actor, right? We never, you know, wrote a story by ourselves because we think we cannot you know represent story of people with lived experience and they should do that themselves but sometimes people are interested in sharing their story but they are not interested in sharing that sharing it themselves right they are you know they're shy or not interested to be filmed to a video so we want to understand if there is a difference between um a lived experience video, which means was written and presented by a person with lived experience to an actor video, which again, it's a video that has a script that was written by a person with lived experience, but only presented by um, uh, a person with uh, an actor. Um, and just also to, um, to add some details about the video, the video production process, the person with lived experience was attending the shooting behind the camera had you know influence of a decision of wardrobe and and editing so it was with the full participation of a person with uh, lived experience but not with the with you know being in front of the camera and we compared that to an intervention video we assumed uh, that we won't find a difference but we wanted to you know uh to check that and indeed uh, in practice both video reduce uh, stigma in the same patterns, right? People see no, saw no difference between, or at least in the stigma level, there was no difference between um, between the two intervention videos. So, a little bit about extended research application, and then I'll speak about real world uh, usage. So, after understanding a little bit about how to reduce public um, stigma toward psychosis, we extended the use of video to other mental illness, right? So we tested whether videos could reduce depression stigma among specifically adolescents and not young adults. So our age range is about 14 to 18 here. And we added some measurements of, you know, help seeking intention to understand if it's uh, increased uh, following a video. So we did a study um, that showed overall efficacy of such videos and then we found that the brief video were effective in re reducing uh, depression stigma. We conducted another study specifically about transphobia among adolescents, and video uh, brief video was found uh, to be effective in that area as well. Um, and then we conducted another study to test the efficacy of short video tailored to the experiences of black girls with depression in the same you know mechanism that I showed you before. We conducted focus groups and, and tested that. Um, in a different line of study, completely different, we tested the efficacy of brief videos to increase openness of essential workers to seek help. We did, we did that in the midst of, of, of the COVID. Essential workers had you know, disturbing rate of depression, anxiety during COVID. Uh, so we were interested to learn more about that. Um, and and you know, with some of the videos that we developed for, for research and study, we do you know, use it, we do use them. Uh, one of them is the video that we created uh, for the essential workers. Uh, we uploaded it to, you know, a state website um, that encouraged people to seek help. It has more than uh, 
uh, 100,000 views. Um, and we also uh, launched uh, a new homepage for OnTruck Central, OnTruck New York, which is an organization that treats people with uh, first episode psychosis. Um, and we and now the homepage is focusing on brief videos of you know personal stories of ultra participants. Some of them we already tested in our uh, studies. So you know a little bit about current work and, and next step. We would like to learn more about how these video works. We think we understood a little bit and we are interested to explore more about it, how it works and for whom, uh, especially. Um, and there is more, more factors to explore. Um, in addition, we would like to apply, uh, we already started to apply the videos to social media. You know, many people consume, especially our people who consume their per preferred content on social media platforms. Um, and uh, at the studies we, we conducted, basically was a first step toward applying videos to social media. We usually prefer to be, you know, to be less than a minute, so people will be more engaged to it. And we prefer to use actors because we we don't have a full control of what's going to happen, you know, with with a video after launching it on a, on on Instagram or, or Facebook or TikTok. Um, and 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 that's why we conducted some of the studies we we sh I just showed you. Um, and and basically the next step is to act to test actual engagement, right? It can be views, likes, uh, share comments and, and or behavior uh, and what people do after they watch a video. Um, and so what, that's why we focused on Instagram, right? And and I'll, go, I'll show you a few slides about what we did so far on Instagram. In general, um, we were focusing, as I said, the videos of up to 60 seconds. We use A-B testing. It's a form of randomization that Instagram Meta has um, to test different content. You know, it belongs to the marketing world, but we can definitely use that for our purposes. We specifically tested uh, emotional engagement as we translate into, you know, number of views, like comments, shares, saves, and behavioral change, which, um, you know, translated into a link that we suggested for more help, mental health help, which led to a landing page. Um, and we conducted, um, you know, called this proof of concept of a uh, social media campaign, which reached um, on a, almost a quarter million of impressions. And and half of that was reached, like real views of the videos, not just, you know, suggesting it to people. Um, and, all, and nearly 1,500 link clicks. And we when we compared two different types of videos. One of them was a video that was already proven effective in our, you know, card sourcing studies. We uh, showed that it's more effective in, in creating uh, a behavioral change, which, you know, again, is what we refer to lean clicks. Um, so you can see that it was more effective. In Instagram world, it was considered, um, statistically significant that's you know determination of a b testing um so we our next steps is to have a better understanding about how brief videos act in the social media world we are very limited in what we are able to understand um but we are eager to um to test that word to see more and reach and you know to more people and to understand what we can learn from that. Um, thank you. And I'm. it's important to especially thank the participant who shared their story. None of it was possible without people, you know, stepping up and share their uh, personal story and allow us to basically test what we t 